Yo, Elliot, I'm dealing with spiritual laziness. I am a Christian and Jesus has saved my life, not only on the cross, but several times throughout my life. I owe him everything I am. The thing is, when I wake up, I'm just thinking about work and money. And I know I have to pray, so I say a short prayer. I'm not reading, excuse me, reading the Bible as much. And throughout the day, I let pride be in me while focusing 100% of my purpose on activities and money. And this is unacceptable. I know one day I'll die and I'll face his judgment. I also feel like a demon is attacking me. When I'm praying, I almost feel a pressure in my chest to quickly finish and go to my other activities. I want to worship, glorify, please, and talk to my Savior on an hourly basis. What are some good ideas to balance my purpose and my mission with connecting and glorifying Him regularly through the day? That's a really good question, man. And there's a couple different angles I want to come from. My, like, the first of which is I can't help but to be in admiration of the five prayers a day that Muslims do. Do you know that, Muslims? I think they like wash their face and they bow their head to the ground and they pray five times a day. And they say, according to, you know, I have Muslim friends, they say that's being on your deen. That means you're doing all the right things. I think in Catholicism, we call it being in a state of grace, right? It's basically doing the right thing every day, whether you feel like it or not. Just like working out, just like eating right, just like anything else. It's one of these things where you just do it because you know you're supposed to do it and you get it done, right? And I know that's a little bit of a contrast to what we hanker for in terms of spirituality, right? We live in a time where everybody wants a spiritual experience and we listen to maybe the lives of the saints or we listen to people who go on ayahuasca trips or people who, you know, meditate and claim that they're, you know, God's talking to me and they're reaching nirvana and stuff. And there was just almost sense like this sense like I'm not doing enough because I'm not having those experiences. Most of what people want with regard to spirituality really is a consolation, a consolation. This is interesting because if you read the work of St. John of the Cross, right, a, 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 a Christian saint, St. John of the Cross, he's got this one book called Dark Night of the Soul. And what he asserts in that book is that the real spiritual warrior prays and does what he has to do even through, especially through what he calls spiritual dryness, right? And so you're calling it spiritual laziness, but I think the laziness comes as a result of dryness, right? Because you get to a particular point where you're like, why am I praying? Why am I doing this? I don't want to do it. It's not, it's not, in other words, it's not giving me anything, right? Because that's what we, that's what we expect in this world, right? You reap, you sow, right? You work, you make money. You work out, you build muscle, Right. But a lot of times with the prayer, prayer life, the spiritual life is like I'm doing this thing, but I'm not getting anything. I and mean, I think that's a part of the reason why uh, Buddhism and, you know, some of these some of these other religions that promise you stuff like you you're going to reach nirvana. Right. You're going to have ecstasy. You're going to you're going to have some spiritual experience are so attractive to us in our effeminate world because we want to get something. But St. John of the Cross says that the true spiritual warrior works through his prayer, especially in times of dryness. That means that you don't have to have any feeling about it. You don't have to have any thought about it. You just do it like you brushing your teeth. Right. And again, that might sound strange because it's like, well, how is that a relationship with the Lord? It's a relationship with the Lord because of justice. Right. I had to convince myself this, too, because I struggle just like you. Right. And I, ha I I'm in and out. Right. There are times when I'm like I'm zealous and there are times when I do the bare minimum. But the whole idea is to keep that thread going. And when you're in that place where you're just doing the bare minimum, you do the bare minimum out of justice because you owe it to your creator. This is his idea. His idea and what he explains through this dark night of the soul is that even when you feel abandoned by the Lord, even when you feel like there's no consolation, right? There's no, there's no gift for my praying that you're really sharpening your sword when you're doing it even when it's dry, he calls it aridness. You do it even when it's dry. So here's the other thing, man. I am, this is the way I see it. 
I'm studying the Bible with my kids. We're doing homeschool. And so I've been doing a, a lot of thought about the fall, right? We've been, we've been doing Genesis, right? And so we're talking about the fall. And in the fall, of course, Adam and Eve are living in blissful communion with God, right? They're in blissful communion with God, but at the same time, they're innocent like animals, right? And this was the way it was in paradise beforehand. But as we know, our fallen nature and the temptation of the demons, because they're still here, and you even talk about the demonic attack, you're right, caused a fall, right? And so there's this transition at that moment when Adam and Eve fall from blissful ignorance to responsibility. And God says this, he says to Adam, for the rest of your life, you're going to have to work, you have to till the soil, you're going to have to break your face, you're going to have to sweat from your brow is how you're going to live. This is what his curse was, because with the understanding, with the awakening that came from eating that tree, that from the tree of good and evil too early, it's my contention that it wasn't that God didn't want them to eat it. He didn't want them to eat it yet because they weren't ready. It's just my belief. And because they were so anxious to be awakened, think about when you're a child and you can't wait to be an adult, right? It's the same sort of thing. It's like, oh, I want that power now. But it's like, you're still a child, bro. You still a trial. I like my children. My children are teenagers. Three of my daughters are teenagers. They want the they want the go the gift of being an adult, the authority of being an adult, the freedom of being an adult, but none of the responsibility because they're still too young. And I think that's what happened in the garden. The God was like, "Hey, look, I got good stuff for you, but chill, wait." And as a result of their hastiness, they were separated from that blissful union with the Lord that in a lot of ways represents subconscious behavior, like an animal. An animal, everything is given to him because it just is. He, and Jesus even reminds us that. He says, the birds don't toil and spin. They ain't worried. Birds ain't worried about it. Why are you worried about your next day? Just eat what you got today. Don't worry about tomorrow. I think before the fall, that's the way things were. We weren't thinking about tomorrow. But there's a curse. We are cursed. We are fallen. And as a result of our ancestors' choices, the fallen nature that's within us now, we must work. You must work. You can't not work. You cannot be a man on this planet and not do work. And I think God understands that. And that's why there's salvation. Because he realizes that, well, we are slaves to our fallen nature. We've become slaves to the, to the demons, the fallen angels, right? Because there, there literally are attacks, and I'm sure you're feeling attacks, right? And you're vulnerable to the attacks. And the attacks have been happening since the beginning with the serpent in the garden. And so with that, he also gives, he also gives Satan his punishment. With that, he understands. I think with that, God understands. He's like, look, they just got to work. They just going to be doing what they have to do. Just fulfill my minimum obligation. And in the Old Testament, there was lots of obligations. The obligation wasn't nearly as, as minimal as it is, is today since Jesus. The minimum obligation was make these sacrifices. Back then, make these sacrifices, live by this law. That's what it was. Live by this law, Ten Commandments, make these sacrifices, right? And that's how you appease the God, right? But since Christ, we've been freed from that curse, but we still live with the, with the consequences of our ancestors and our current fallen nature. And as a result of living with those consequences, right, we still must work. You must think about your purpose. You must work with your activities. You must make money. But focusing on it with pride, and you say this, throughout the day, I let my pride be in me while focusing 100% on my purpose, activities, and money, and that's unacceptable. I don't think it's unacceptable. Hear me out. What I think needs to happen is that you work for the Lord. You work for God. You recognize that I am a hand of the Lord, and wherever he's guiding me, wherever he's putting me, whatever responsibilities are given to me now are a form of worship for the Lord. Doing your job, check this out, this is beautiful. Doing your work is worship to the Lord, right? Especially if you're doing righteous work. I'm not talking about if you was a, a banker or a Shylot of some sort. You working on the field, working, in, working with your hands. Me, this is my work. I don't know what you call it. 
right? But I'm a voice. I'm a mouthpiece. I'm a mouthpiece for God. And I'm not preaching the gospel. I'm speaking common sense. I'm speaking law. I'm speaking natural law to people. That's why a lot of people don't like me. I say things that are based on natural law, especially as it relates to our, the perversion of our genders, right? V gender perversion and feminism are all an attack on the family. And so everything that I do, I remind myself, first of all, this is how I do it. This is how I approach it. When I find myself wrapped up in work, I say, look, everything that I'm doing is to help maintain, preserve, promote God's natural law, right? I'm speaking to you guys, and guess what? I'm wrapped up in it. I'm wrapped up in all the emails I got to answer. I'm wrapped up in all the videos I got to make. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm wrapped up in trying to do a good job even sometimes. I make these videos or I'm, I'm speaking to you guys and I'm like, man, I want to be fully present. I want to give you guys all the gifts I got. I want to give you my best, right? I'm not thinking about God, but I'm getting out the way and letting the Lord work through me because I know ultimately seeds are being planted. I used to, when I was a Baha'i, Right. I would go to it was a religious community. Right. They were Abrahamic, just like uh, Christians, Muslims, Jews. And so I had a lot of the same perspectives. The guy that taught me the, the faith, he made paper. He was a paper maker. And one of the tenets of the faith of the Baha'i faith is that work is work shall be elevated to worship. Work is elevated to worship. And so as we would explore that. Right. And we would I would do these studies with them. He explained to me, he said, look, man, I just make paper. I'm just a paper maker, and I don't know what people are going to write on that paper. I don't know what going to do with that paper, but the bottom line is I do every activity I do. Every time I make paper, I do it for the glory of the Lord, and that means I'm going to do it the best I can do it and have good intentions for it, right? Even if you sweep in the street, you're making the world beautiful. You're making the place beautiful, and you know what beauty does? This is one of the, this is one of the things that is lost in contemporary religion particularly Protestant Christianity, beauty. Beauty is a gift from God. And if you, <coughs> if you live a life beautifying something, you're glorifying the Lord, right? I have a landscaper, right? My neighbor, he comes and he bush hogs. He cleans up my whole yard. And I pay him. <coughs> he's doing the work of the Lord because he's manicuring his creation, he, just like as was given to us in the garden, God expects us to take good care of what's around us. If you build in houses, you're cut, cutting lawns, you're, you're putting fruit out on display at the supermarket, you're creating beauty, you're providing service, you're working with the Lord. The main thing is perspective, though. When pride creeps in, at least for me in the past, when, when pride creeps in, it means I'm doing this for me. What am I getting out of this, right? And also judging myself on how it's getting done. But if I relinquish all that and I let that be and I just say, Lord, accept my sacrifice. Because your work is now your sacrifice, right? And that's why we tithe as well. If I make that my sacrifice and I keep that forefront and in my mind, then all day long I'm praying, right? It's perspective. One book I would invite you to read. Oh man, such a good book. <coughs> it's by Brother Lawrence and it call, it's called Practicing the Presence. Practicing the Presence, that's what it's called. Practicing the Presence of God. And this guy, he's a monk. He's in a monastery, right? He's in a monastery. But he takes the most lowly jobs, and he does the most mundane things. But everything that this guy does, it's an amazing book. Brother Lawrence, Practicing the Presence. He practices the presence of the Lord in every single activity that he does. He, it, his main work was in the kitchen, right? And, you, and he, in this book is his letters to his friends. And you see where he struggles, but then you see where he bounces back. Because there are times like he's working in the kitchen. And it's funny. Wow, there's a number of different stories about this. I don't know if it's just... Uh, Lawrence, but I've read other saints like this, where Lawrence, Brother Lawrence would, there was this one, I think it was him, there's a, this moment where he's carrying all these, these dishes, glasses, and they break, right? And he has this streak of clumsiness, and he starts beating himself up, and people start, you know, like, oh, you're not doing a good job. And in that 
space of feeling down about himself, he's consoled by the presence of the Lord by saying or reminding himself that this is all a part of his worship to God and that maybe this is a means by which he can be humbled and once again lean on his creator, right? So he doesn't let it get him down. It's perspective, my man. It really is. It's how you're looking at your, your situation, right? It's how you're looking at your situation. Going full, coming full circle, because I talked about the Muslims praying five times a day, and I talked about doing what you have to do whether you feel like it or not. I think that if we live a life that is practicing the presence, that when we do get into our space of praying in our closet, right? We get our space of alone time with the Lord, and we're doing it because we have to do it, but we're practicing the presence, we stop beating ourselves up, right? One last thing I would share with you is this. When you feel you're under attack, right? And it's funny because you are under attack. Now, you may be under attack by demons or your own fallen nature, right? Because attacks come from many different angles, right? Our own fallen nature attacks us, right? And this, this anxiety, this sense that I need to get it done, I need to get it done fast, I got other things to do. Sometimes it's a demon, but sometimes it's our own BS. When you catch yourself in that place, first of all, forgive yourself. And then just like Brother Lawrence, practice the presence because the Lord forgives you. He knows, he knows that you're struggling and he's with you through your struggles. Read Psalm 51, King David, Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the Psalm of repentance. David screws up big time. Nobody's more blessed than Jesus. I'm sorry. Well, in this context, David, nobody was more blessed than David. David was the greatest, greatest king of Israel. David screwed up. And so David in Psalm 51 is so fascinating. He, he opens himself to the Lord, but he makes, he, for his own consolation and in, in, in making reparations to the Lord, he says, I was born in, in the womb of sin. Something to that effect. He says, I was born in my mother's womb that was full of sin. Basically, I was born into this fallen world. I don't know any better. I'm trying my best, but I'm going to screw up. I'm going to screw up. I screwed up and I, I'm repenting. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that he had to pay the consequences for his actions as we all do. But he repented. And he reminds us through Psalm 51 that, hey, you know what? God, I know you're going to forgive me because I was born in this mess and I don't know any better. We are surrounded by evil, bro. I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole because it's a wild ass rabbit hole. But much of what we experience on a daily basis, even in terms of our evolved technology, it comes from evil. A lot of it comes from evil. A lot of it comes from fallen angels, demonic entities that seek to manipulate and control and destroy us. These things are so pleasurable, but that's the problem. This technology is so pleasurable, but it's a means by which we're tracked, by which they're listening to us, by which we can be perjured, right? Is that the right word? Where they can, they can do whatever they want with the information that's in that. And we all sign up for it. It's a demonic technology. This is a demonic technology that tastes so damn good. It's like ice cream with a fat diabetic. It's like, damn, this shit tastes so good, but it's killing me. What does the Lord expect? Your fallen nature draws you to it. It's unrolled throughout the world. It's all here. You're swimming in it. You can't get away from it. Forgiveness. God forgives. Stay in a state of grace, which means do the right thing when you know you're supposed to do the right thing. Don't sin. Do your best not to sin. Right? Know what sin is. Understand what sin is as a byproduct of our fallen nature. It's our lower nature. It's our lowest nature. Understand that we are made noble through grace. And walk every day with the gratitude for the forgiveness that God bestows upon us when we're trying our best. Do your best. Be sincere. But don't beat yourself up. Because that's what you're doing. You're sincere. I know you're sincere. God knows you're sincere. But you're beating yourself up. And when you beat yourself up, now, not only do you have the strike, right? You have the issue 
that you're trying your best, but you're not getting it done. But now you're literally trying to play God. You don't know how God is taking what you're doing and how God sees what you're doing. You have no clue what God's plan is for you. Don't be so arrogant as to think that you're disappointing God because you're not praying five times a day. Your sentiment, every action is measured by the sentiment from which it proceeds is most important. What attitude am I coming to this work with? What attitude am I coming to this prayer with? What attitude do I have towards myself? Right? And all these things should ease your soul. They should calm your soul. Right? This is consolation, right? Sometimes the prayer doesn't give us consolation, but the word does. And these are, these are ideas straight from the word. Right? The words. Right? That's why God gives us the Bible. That's why God gives us Psalm 51. That's why God gives us Genesis and explains to us our origin story, right? So that we don't beat ourselves up and so that we know what the right thing to do is and we try our best every day. You know, there's something called legalism. Have you ever heard this? Legalism, and, and St. Paul speaks out against legalism. Legalism was a Jewish institution, right, where the Jews believe that, that they could only reach salvation by following the letter of the law. But Jesus came to sort of raise it up. He raised the law up. He didn't abolish the law, but he made it a law of the heart. The law of the heart goes beyond the law, law of activity because you see that there were times when Jesus was doing things that was against the law. There was... Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, right? And then he said, and then the, and then the law keepers, right? The, the 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 legalists, right? The priests of the time were like, check this guy out. He's not following the law. He's not doing the right thing. And then Jesus gives him, you know, a metaphor and explains to him that, you know, I'm trying. What he explained was that if a shepherd loses one of his sheep to a wolf on the Sabbath. He's going to go get that sheep, right? He loves that sheep. It's the Sabbath. But I ain't going to let that wolf have my goddamn sheep. When he saved that man or when he healed that man, he, what his perspective was and what he explained was where his heart was is this is one of the Lord's sheep. I am the shepherd of this sheep and I must bring him back into the fold. It wasn't about the law, following the law or disobeying the law. It was about the law of the heart. And so if you're sincere and you're living by the law of the heart, that's the best you could do. Will God receive that on your day of judgment? I don't know. Right? I don't know. Because nobody knows. Nobody knows. So I hope that helps, dude. Done. Yo, it's your bro, Elliot. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, you ought to know that it was a clip from one of my most recent King Transformation classes with my students, where among other things, we get together about four or five hours a week and we speak on things as it relates to becoming kings in our lives and fitness, business, and with women. If that sounds like you and you wanna join a like-minded group of men who are growing stronger every day, in every way in this degenerate age, then it's real simple. Just follow me on Instagram and then DM me the word king, K-I-N-G, and then me and my team will get back to the details to see if you qualify. I really hope to see you at the next meeting, done.